Hey, what's up guys and gals? It's the Tyrant here. Hope y'all are having a great day today. I've got a very special treat for you today. So before I get into that, recently I posted a video about how I felt about Halo 2. And some of you really didn't take to that too well. So I decided this time, let me debate this with a professional. Someone who knows these games inside and out. You guys know him as well. And I'm going to debate Halo 2 with someone who is an avid fan. And his name is Hidden Xperia. Hidden Xperia, go ahead and tell him a little bit about yourself. Hey guys, uh, so I imagine that quite a few of you already know who I am. Uh, I'm the guy behind that fantastic iconic meme. Uh, I make a lot of video, a lot of Halo lore videos, uh, mainly focused around the flood. But I also do sort of like critical videos every now and then, uh, breaking down at certain aspects of Halo uh, and art style stuff as well. Uh, and I'm also the creator of the shameful, embarrassing dab for Halo 2017 movement, of which I hate myself for. And thank you for that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, today we're going to explore Halo 2 a little bit. Uh, most of you who've already seen my video know my perspective. Uh, and Hidden Xperia has a little bit of a different take on it. So, before we actually get into it, Hidden Xperia, tell me a little bit about your experience with Halo 2. Why do you like it so much? And we're going to go ahead and take it from there. My experience with Halo 2, that is a long one. Um, Halo 2 is its my favorite game of all time. Uh, it has my favorite soundtrack, my favorite gameplay, my favorite dialogue, my favorite missions, my favorite multiplayer. It has my favorite across the board. Um, I, th I also think the art style for it is perfect. I started playing Halo 2. Uh, I'm pretty sure I did get it the day that it came out in 2004. Um, the day that it came out in the UK, that is, because I think... I think, like Combat Evolved, Halo 2 came out a little bit later in the UK, only a few days. Um, but I've basically been playing it since it came out. I had already started playing Halo um, in 2002 when Combat Evolved came out in the UK. Um, so I was already well versed about Halo, I already loved it. Uh, I'm not sure if I'd read any of the novels yet. I think I'd read Fall of Reach by that point. Um, but I was still, I think when Halo 2 came out, I was eight. So I was, I was a pretty young dude. I was a pretty young dude. Got you. So, okay, so you, you were young and naive. We got that part down. <laughs> right. So, definitely but by the way, what he's saying there is was definitely important. So, right now we established where he he started from uh, in the Halo franchise before Halo Two actually came out, and this is important because if you didn't keep up, well, uh, we'll get to the marketing in a second, but. If Territory you went into captured. Halo 2 blindly, or Territory if uh, Halo 2 was your first game, you have a different sense for it. As opposed to if you're someone who was very avidly involved with the Halo universe, you picked out every aspect of it. And we're going to touch on that right now. So we already know what your experience uh, was prior to Halo 2. Thank you for filling that in. Um, yep. uh, the marketing campaign is an interesting thing. So a lot of people were upset with Halo 5 Guardians because the Hunt the Truth marketing campaign really didn't make it into the game itself, or at least that's the interpretation most people have. If you remember correctly, Hunt the Hunt the Truth, for those of you who don't remember, basically picked Locke against the Chief. You didn't really know who was the good guy and the bad guy, and if it was Chief, you didn't really understand why. And then when the game came out, it pretty much gave that, in the way, gave that away in the second mission. Chief and Locke have sort of a cat fight later on. Cat and then after that, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> And then after that, of course, uh, it, Chief more or less takes, or the Locke pretty much take, takes uh, Chief's side and just wants to help him. So really, Hunt the Truth wasn't there at all. You didn't see Locke saying, you were the savior and now I'm going to stop you or anything like that. So in that regard, Halo 2 had a very similar impact on Terry me. Terry I did keep up with the, the marketing from day one. My brother was the one who showed me the original teaser trailer. Later on, he showed me the E3 2003 gameplay demo, which depicted a very open world, post-apocalyptic, or in the process of going through an apocalypse on Earth. You see Earth being glass in the background in the first trailer. In the second one, you see this double or triple decker city in Africa called New Mombasa. And it seems fairly open world, just like the original game. And of course, it ends with Covenant pods raining from the sky and they're all elites and they're surrounding the chief. And when the game actually comes out, uh, the entire marketing campaign was very Earth centric. It was very Master Chief centric. And so everyone thought the game was going to be like that. And of course, as we know, it was nothing like that. 
the uh, out of the 14 playable missions, and yes, I'm countering Armory because they counted as a mission, <laughs> damn it. And so I'm counting as a one. mission too. And so out of the 14 playable missions of the game, only two of them take place on the surface of the Earth. And if you really want to stretch it, Cairo Station, which takes place in orbit, is also technically, I mean, again, this is really stretching in here in Earth mission. So out of 14 playable missions, two to three actually take place on the surface of the Earth. Now, uh, Hidden Xperia, what was your ordeal with that uh, in comparison? Did you follow the marketing campaign at all or what, what, what was your deal with that? Uh, like you said, I was too young and naive to, <laughs> to follow the marketing <laughs> campaign. Um, the only thing that I saw from Halo 2, the only reason I even knew Halo 2 was happening was because uh, we had somebody who was painting our house at the time in 2003 and he knew I was a Halo fan and he brought around this disc that had a preview trailer uh, of Halo 2, which was the trailer where Chief jumps out of Cairo with a bomb. Or the bomb wasn't actually there, but he jumps out of Cairo. And that was the only reason that I knew Halo 2 was happening. Um, so no, I didn't keep up with the marketing campaign and that might impact my views on the game, uh, like we were discussing earlier. I, I didn't know any of this stuff. I, I didn't know about this save earth stuff. I literally just went into the game knowing that I was going to be playing as Master Chief and I was going to be fighting the Covenant again. That's all I went into the game knowing. So you were spared that little bit of disappointment. Good for you. Yeah, I think I'm Ivan. <laughs> all right, so we, we've got that down. Um, so we had talked about you know, your experience with it. You said that you know you were really into the first game and that you read The Fall of Reach. Uh, did you read First Strike as well? Nah, I didn't read First Strike until, I want to say, 2005 or six. I think it was five. Oh, okay, so the thing of it is, and here's where my perspective starts to come in, if you played the first game and you loved it, which you obviously did, uh, then oh, you yeah. read Fall of Reach, which, again, and this is not criticizing you, at the age of eight versus, I think I was 17 when I read it, um, oh, you a, have a sort a of a different take. <laughs> there's a difference in understanding. It's, for sure. It, th exactly. There's a there's a huge difference in, in the continuity between Halo Reach and or I'm sorry, the Halo the Fall of Reach, Halo Combat Evolved, and First Strike, which takes place between Halo Combat Evolved and Halo 2, uh, had a very good flow to it. And if there's one thing I know you can appreciate in Xperia, it's lore. Yeah. Hell that yeah. is big Hell for yeah. you. So yeah. the first thing we want to talk about is the lore or the continuity between Combat Evolved and and Halo 2. Obviously, we're going to talk about one of the big elephants in the room here, and that's the fact that in Halo 2, the Covenant can speak English. Yeah. Now, in Halo Combat Evolved, technically the grunts could speak English too. Personally, I always thought they were maybe parroting the humans or they were just stuck in there for comedic purposes because they are funny. Oh, yeah. And I think sure. that it definitely added some charm to the game. But in Halo 2, basically from the first scene where he says, it was only one ship. And you're sitting there going, who's talking right now? <laughs> and, then, and then you go to High Charity and you see a very different take on the Covenant. So the first thing I want to ask you is what was your immediate reaction when the Covenant now seemed less barbaric and more civilized and they could be understood? I'd argue more barbaric after seeing what Tartarus does to Arbiter at the end of that cutscene. But uh, my my view of that... I... I think I think at the point because I was still I was eight years old when Halo Two came out I was like oh this is cool we can the alien we can understand <laughs> the aliens now we can hear what they're saying and I I actually love seeing the inner workings of them I thought that was really cool I love seeing the council chamber and the actual sort of like I'm not gonna say politics because I was way too young to understand politics but I love seeing the the background of this enemy because in in Combat Evolved they were very two dimensional like there's nothing even if you'd read Fall of Reach. I would still argue that the Covenant and Combat Evolved were two-dimensional, whereas Halo 2 added a whole different dimension to them. They became 3D, like, fucking instantly. Seeing the way they worked in the background, seeing the the consequence of their failed mission in Combat Evolved, I loved that. I thought it was great. And, and it certainly is interesting to see the inner workings. Do you think they could have pulled that off, though, without the Covenant speaking English and maybe having subtitles nah, instead? Nah, I don't think that would have worked. I think having them speak English w was the best way to do it because subtitles, you've got to always remember as well, are an optional thing. Having having subtitles forced in the cutscene uh, would be kind of weird for those people that haven't turned off. They'd be like, hang on, I, I turned subtitles off. Why are they showing up? I, I think I think having them voiced, having them speak English and be voiced was the best idea. 
It is true that subtitles can be turned off, and I will give you that, but typically when a movie has to translate something, they're going to be there by default. Uh, for this, I'm going to give an example. Uh, Halo War, or Halo Wars, ha, Halo 4 <laughs> Spartan Assault. Now, you and I both have similar feelings about Spartan Assault, but in that one, the Covenant did speak their native language. Uh, the the Sangheili obviously spoke their native tongue and even attempted to speak English a couple of times when the doctor, I think it was Glassman, you know, yeah, said yeah, he didn't was. speak Sangheili. And so you saw the subtext of what they were actually saying. And to me, that was a bit more effective and matched the continuity of what I was expecting from the Covenant more than all of a sudden, bam, they can speak English and even the humans can understand them. But you've got to remember that in that cutscene, it's the cutscene where Glassman has that bomb strapped to him uh, and Jill says some angry words to him in, in English. <laughs> you got to remember that. Jill, Jill, Jill was speaking for probably five seconds. The, the cutscene heretic is like seven minutes long. The, that, that worked in... I will say that did work in Spartan Ops's uh, situation, but explaining the inner workings of the enemy in that way, I think would have been would have sounded weird. Because when Joel was speaking, you could very clearly tell that he could, he couldn't speak English. He was he was just trying to he was trying to speak English. He, he couldn't do it very well. Whereas obviously, you listen to how Truth or the Arbiter or Tartarus speaks, it sounds a lot more fluent, and I think that aided in helping explain and flesh out their background a lot more. Okay, that's fair enough. So essentially, uh, it, it helps you understand the Covenant more to have them speak English. Now, here, here's where things get a little bit more interesting. The, the fact that the humans can now understand them too, how, how, and you couldn't back in Combat Evolved or even Reach for that matter. Uh, how do you explain yeah. that in terms of continuity? I, the way I always saw that was translators. They had translators. They had a and, and a lot of people have probably. said that, and here's where I rebuke that. Okay, so they apparently had translators in Halo 2, but why not in Halo 4? Uh, that's true. My, I actually have a headcanon for that. My headcanon for that is the fact that... Um, I hate calling them this because this isn't what they're called. The Storm Covenant, in air quotes. Jill and Dharma's Covenant. I always just looked at them and thought that they spoke a different sort of like type of Sangheili. Uh, or like a different, a different language entirely. I don't know if that's canonically the case. Um, I, I, I honestly don't know if that's the case at all, but I just, I always assumed that they spoke a different language to the Covenant that we fought in 1, 2, and 3. It's not impossible. It's certainly a, a possibility for sure. I don't think that's the case, but I, yeah. I can certainly see some. Oh yeah, that, that that's, that's artistic license to make the aliens feel a lot more alien again. Exactly. So, the, all right, so let's go back to the continuity for a second. So, uh, the first mission, uh, the first few missions, basically the Covenant show up to Earth. Now, in the game, it doesn't tell you how they actually found Earth. It does sort of hint at it in First Strike, but it doesn't actually tell you. Now, does it seem a little odd to you? Like, you know, as someone who read The Fall of Reach yeah. and how aggressive the Covenant always were, how they would show up to a world, uh, they would, you know, destroy glass it, they'd it. search for artifacts in the meantime, and then they'd eventually glass it and move on. Now... We, we even saw this with Reach. So in terms of defenses, you know, even if you say the other colonies didn't have strong defenses or anything like that, now we come to Reach where it was one of the most highly defended planets out there. And it was a big battle, granted, but the Covenant had to have known somehow that it was populated by humans first, obviously, because they came in, a, uh, I think it was yeah. a fleet of 300 or something like that. It was a big At least in terms of the Reach. Or the fall of reach, anyway. I don't know about the game, but in the fall of reach, yeah, that's, that's a whole different kind of worms. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll save that for another video. Yeah. <laughs> um, even though I think you and I are on the same page on that one, so it wouldn't be much of a debate. I'd be pretty short, sure safe. But uh, okay, so but in Halo Two, they show up in a very small fleet. Yeah. And despite the humans being there, they don't retreat at all. They try to go forth anyway. They land on Earth. That's when Cortana says, I don't even think they knew that we were here. Not you and me, of course. Yeah. Humanity <laughs> on yeah. Earth. And I'm sitting there going, wait, what? That's some fantastic gondola speech right there in the underwater gondola. <laughs> I know exactly where that's from. <laughs> so, actually, she said it twice in the game. She said it both uh, in the tunnels in, on outskirts. Oh, and she yeah, said it yeah, 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 yeah on the gondola as well. So she repeated herself. Little Cortana deja vu there. I think we're seeing some early signs of rampancy, <laughs> <Sounds> Cortana. Rampancy, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so what was your take on that? 
Uh, I thought it was kind of cool. It made sense because it was very clear that Regret was... I mean, Cortana says, eventually, Regret jumped the gun. Like, Regret took matters into his own hands. Uh, and obviously, you see the fruit of that towards the end of Halo 2. So, I, I kind of liked it. I kind of liked it. The reason... You could tell that if this was the entire Covenant that appeared all of a sudden... Earth probably wouldn't have survived that. Like, if it was the entire Covenant, they wouldn't have survived that. So, off the gate, I think you could kind of tell that it wasn't the entire Covenant and that it was just a small, not rogue fleet, but a small sort of splinter fleet. Uh, no, I, I kind of liked it. And it played into Regret's character quite well as well. Regret was like the first Hierarch to go crazy. And, and I agree with you there. He certainly was, he was, was always said as young. And kind of naive. Now, when it comes to, <laughs> like an eight-year-old. No, I'm only mm. kidding. But yep, like an eight-year-old. Like good old eight-year-old me. <laughs> so, but did it feel, I mean, okay, you're an adult now and you were a kid then. As an adult now, does the continuity of how the Covenant acted in Halo 2 versus Combat Evolved and the Fall of Reach, doesn't it seem just a little bit off or a little bit out of character for them? Honestly, no, it doesn't. Because... The, we all know the Hierarchs were crazy, Truth especially, um, but honestly, it doesn't, no, it, it doesn't, it, it feels pretty natural to me. But why is this the first time that we actually hear about such a case? Wait, sorry, say that again. Oh, sorry. So why, uh, but in that, in this situation, why is this the first time that we've seen oh. such a scenario where the a prophet sort of just randomly takes off and goes on his own little adventure only to find out, whoops, I'm in over my head here. <laughs> I mean, the war had been going on for 27 years. It had been going on for quite yeah, a long exactly. time. Uh, granted, you could argue the Covenant was still pretty much on the upper hand. Uh, but I don't know. It, it, I'm not going to say that it it's like perfectly natural, but it, it, for me, it, it fit. It felt, it felt natural enough when I played it originally and when I replay it now. It still feels natural. Um, maybe that's because I've, pl I've replayed Halo 2's campaign more than I've breathed oxygen. But I don't know. It's, it's just, <laughs> you need it, to breathe more often. <laughs> yeah, I, sh I probably should do, you know. Or, or maybe I should stop playing Halo 2 so much. I'm not sure. But uh, one or the other. But no, it, it, to me, it, it genuinely just it, it feels natural. It feels like a crazy, a crazy religious leader um, jumped the gun, got too eager, um, and bit off more than he could chew. Okay, so we'll, we'll go with that for now. Now, at the end of Metropolis, of course, we know that they released a Scarab. Yeah. And, of course, it's there for a while. Not really sure why they deployed it so early if their main point of a Scarab is, or at least that type of Scarab, because there's a couple of them, Yeah. Uh, is for excavation. Uh, I'm not even really worried about that aspect of it, to be honest with you. But at the end of the mission, uh, Regret decides, okay, I've had enough of this bullshit. <laughs> and so, you know, see the gravity beam go up, slip space jump later, Boom, he's gone, and I'm going to skip a little bit ahead. We'll go back to the Arbiter in a second, but we're going to skip to uh, the mission Delta Halo. Boom, he, he comes out of slip space. Of course, Miranda and the in amber clad is tailing uh, Regret ship at this point, and they somehow find another Halo ring. Now, again, I don't know what they found on Earth. I don't know if they had prior knowledge of these coordinates. They didn't have anything dug up by the, or by the end of that act. So I think the next question is, don't you find it a little too coincidental that in such a short period of time, they managed to find two out of the seven Halo rings? <laughs> now, I honestly, this is really bad. This has slipped my mind whether or not Regret actually knew about the location of Delta Halo. Um, but I don't know. Given what, the, given what the rings do and given what we already knew about the flood, kind of didn't shock me that much that there'd be more than one ring. Uh, considering the radius of the ring and everything, it kind of didn't shock me that much that there was more than one. Uh, when it was when they revealed, obviously at the end of the game, that there were seven rings. That was that hit me. I was like, okay, that's that's pretty significant. I didn't expect there to be, there to be seven, but uh, <laughs> not not really. And also, you got to remember the game. The fact that the game is called Halo, people expect to fight on Halo rings. That has become sort of a staple of the series. Granted, Halo Four and Five haven't done that, but. And Halo Reach. That, I, I, I did kind of expect to be fighting on a ring because of the name. Maybe that was young, naive no, I, me, but I, I kind of expected <laughs> that. But looking back on it now as the lore guy that you are, yeah. you know, because you're huge, big into lore. You love continuity. You're really, especially since I knew that you were a little taken off guard when they tried to uh, turn the flood lore in a different direction for Halo Wars 2. Yeah, you can fucking say that again. <laughs> that gave me a headache. <laughs> 
at the time, don't you think it's a little too coincidental that they were able to find two rings, galaxy-wide, mind you, could be anywhere in the galaxy, by seemingly complete coincidence? I mean, from a story standpoint, I kind of, maybe, yeah, kind of, but it, it is pretty coincidental. But you got to remember, like, looking away from the story and looking more into the real world, Bungie only expected to make one Halo. It was meant to be Correct. one Halo and then move on. They didn't expect to make another one, let alone a trilogy or an entire franchise. So I I think they sort of thought like, okay, so what worked in Combat Evolved? What can we carry forward? The Halo Ring worked. Everyone loved walking on the Halo Ring and fighting on this massive alien world. Let's carry that forward. That's I'll, I'll, that's my view on that. I'll put my view, that forward as my view on that. But even then, it's sort of interesting that Delta Halo is so different in appearance to Alpha Halo. When yeah. you think about it, because... You know, you look at uh, Alpha Halo, all the structures look very futuristic, very alien, very slick in nature. Then you get to Delta Halo, and it's all ancient ruins. Yeah, well, I mean, we did visit different locations on the ring. Uh, like, when we went to the quarantine zone, that was all kind of, air quotes, futuristic. Metal. That was all Forerunner and stuff. So, we did visit different places, but all the, all, the, all the rings do have different topology. Is topology the right word? Somebody will correct yes. me in the comments. I think I think topo <laughs> topology is the right word. But they, they all have, they all have different uh, environments and stuff. They aren't all the same. So, I mean, obviously we didn't know that then. But looking back, I'm like, ah, that's that's fine. That's fine. I'm okay with that. All right. So we're gonna backtrack just a little bit and get to the Arbiter. Now, a lot of people don't remember this uh, because you know Halo Two came out several years ago. It came back out back way in 2004, and one of the biggest controversies in the game was the Arbiter. Yeah. Now, over time, we've, I've had a lot of time to really think on it, and I've warmed up to the Arbiter quite a bit. I think he's a great character. I like the fact that we trade out our broken flashlight for a very useful active candle, <laughs> even though on Legendary it only lasts, lasts for about half a second or yeah, so. Yeah, it's like two seconds. Not even that. It's like on Legendary, it's like you can, before you count to one, you're out of it. And I had to find that out the hard way, <laughs> might, I, might I add. So... Uh, Arbiter is sort of a pivotal point, at least at that period of time, because again, when Halo 2 was marketed, we saw two things. We saw Earth and we saw the Master Chief. Now, it was an interesting surprise, and I know that you personally like seeing that side of the Covenant, but how was your take on a comp not, not just playing as the Arbiter, but the fact that all of a sudden you are Covenant fighting Covenant? Oh, uh, dude, I, I fucking loved it. The Arbiter is the one mission that I used to replay time after time after time after time. I absolutely loved it. I did find it a little bit weird that we were fighting Covenant. I did expect to be fighting humans, um, but I, I loved it. I That was my favorite mission back in the day because I, I used to love how the elites looked in Halo 2. Uh, I used to, I mean, I still do. They're still my favorite elite design Halo 2s. Um, but I, I used to love how they looked. I used to love fighting al alongside them, hearing all their quotes and stuff. Uh, I, yeah, I loved it. I used to love it. Now, being someone who was really into the first game, how did you feel about, in general, the campaign being split between the two characters? Uh, kind of, e even that the tones really weren't that different, you know, the especially when you compare them to Halo 5 Guardians. Um, how did you sort of feel going back and forth between the two characters? You know, you go, you're, you're the Master Chief for three missions, then you're the Arbiter for two, and then it's like, oh yeah, I forgot, the Chief just teleported, you know, through half half of the galaxy to get to the second Halo ring. Yeah, um, I, I, I'll i be honest, I can't remember exactly how I how I viewed that. Um, I do remember liking it. Uh, I, I, I don't think that it was jarring at all. I think Halo 5's uh, take on it was a lot more jarring because e each section in Halo 2 where you play as Chief and Arbiter, you all, in each section where you play as Chief, you... Uh, you reach a goal or something. So, like, for example, the first arc is Chief, you defend Earth. And then the first arc is Arbiter, you defeat the Heretic Leader. And then so on, so on. So it felt more, like, complete and coherent than Halo 5's uh, take on it. And I, I enjoyed... I actually enjoyed flicking between perspectives. I thought it was quite cool. It was cool seeing how your actions as Chief then affected what you do as Arbiter. And that definitely, that definitely becomes apparent towards the end of the game. Uh, I think it's at the very start of Sacred Icon when Tartarus and Arbiter are in the Phantom and they're talking about Chief and Arbiter's like, the demon is here and Tartarus is like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like that. I like how your goals as one character affected the other. Okay, so we got that down. Very good, by the way. I think that's an excellent take on it. And of course, 
especially when you get to the end of the game and you're going back and forth on every mission. It's not just like every two yeah. or three. It, it does make a little bit more sense. But I'm going to bring up the real thing here, and that's the end of the game. And, of course, the, this is sort of a two-part deal. So at the end of the game, the final chief is actually, or the final mission is actually with the Arbiter rather than the Master Chief. And then it stops at a to be continued. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, it was the middle part of a franchise. I'm pretty sure by Halo, by Halo 2, they'd confirmed that it was going to be a trilogy, I, I think. So it was the middle part of a, of a trilogy. It's always going to end on a cliffhanger. Part two, of, part two out of three is always going to be a cliffhanger. Um, so it makes sense that there was a cliffhanger. I thought the cliffhanger, it, the game deserved a cliffhanger a lot more than Halo 5 did. Because, like I was just saying, in Halo 2, you actually achieve goals. You defend Earth. You defeat the Heretic Leader. Um, you you actually attain goals. Whereas in Halo 5, not that much happens. You don't Like we were discussing earlier, you don't really do anything. You kill Jalim Dharma in a cutscene, and that's it. <laughs> um, which actually so, had, had no impact on the rest of the game. Yeah, yeah that too, which felt like a complete, like a section of a completely different story. Whereas in Halo 2, it all felt very together, very coherent, um, and all the acts flowed together well, and w the ending of each act flowed into the next act quite well as well. So I, I think it I think it deserved its cliffhanger. I'm not going to say it was the best option ever, um, and that it was the best way to end the game. Um, obviously, Bungie were very pushed for time. I, I think everyone knows that by now, that Halo 2's development oh, yes. like, literally broke up relationships. It was that bad. It was not <laughs> yeah. a fun time for Bungie, um, but I, I enjoyed it, and I think I think it's it's a badass ending. It's a pretty fucking good ending, sir. It's a good ending looking fight. back on it now. But I have to say, back then, you know, when you first get to the end of that screen after waiting for the game for years to come out, only to find out that the fight wasn't over. And neither was that particular chapter either. Yeah, and technically neither was the battle on Earth either. So. No, it was yeah. not. <laughs> um, and, and to add a little bit to that, uh, again, just the the fact that it was to be continued uh, and knowing that you had three more years that you had to wait is just a little bit jarring. Oh, yeah. Every, all, all of the things considered. Again, it wasn't a terrible thing looking back on it now, but of course now we could just, you know, pop in the next disc. Or if you're playing the Master Chief Collection, move over to the next game. Yeah. And so we're going to go back just a little bit. We talked about the story at this point. So it's had its pros and cons. Let's talk about the gameplay. Ooh. This is very eccentric here. So I have, yeah, you know what I'm going to touch on. I think I do. So uh, before we get into it, as a gamer, as someone who's been playing since you were a kid, which do you find to be more important in a video game? Is it lore slash story or is it gameplay? Gameplay every single day, hands down, without a shadow of a doubt. Excellent. That's a good answer. And that's the same one I would have given. Because let's be real here. Lore is, you know, nowadays it's important, I guess, because it's become more established. But it's a video game. If I want to, if, if I'm really interested in story, I'll, I'll watch a movie. Yeah, for sure. Read a book, watch a movie, listen to an audio book. It's, yeah. Yeah. Games, exactly. are, for, so, games are for playing. So you and I are definitely on the same page in that category. Now, Halo 2's gameplay... Can you agree was very different than Combat Evolves? Um, it was different. It was tighter. It was more responsive. Um, it was balanced very, very, very differently. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, I yeah, it's, it's, for sure it's different, but it's nowhere near as different as the gameplay that Reach added or Halo 5 added. Um, and I agree with it, you. Those... It's different, but not that much. Uh, and I agree that Halo Reach's gameplay was definitely a pivotal point for Halo fans. It wasn't even as popular as Halo 3, and it was still made by Bungie back in the day. Yeah. Uh, Halo 5 sort of speaks for itself, so I'm not even going to touch on that <laughs> right now. But uh, for Halo 2, uh, it starts you out. We're going to talk about a couple of different aspects. Uh, first of all, what was one of the in terms of gameplay, what was some of your favorite aspects about Combat Evolved? Uh, Combat Evolved. I like how it's not really the gameplay, it's tied to the gameplay. I loved how open the level design was and how it allowed for exploration. I thought that was great. Um, I like how, at least in the campaign, every weapon in the sandbox had a purpose. Every weapon was useful, even though like, the Nidra and the Plasma Pistol were. Um, every single weapon in the, in the campaign was useful. Uh, the vehicles were fun to use. Um, 
The health system was great. I still miss the health system, I'll be honest. I kind of wish they'd bring that back in vein of CE. Um, I think Combat Evolved did that stuff right. And of course, when you get to multiplayer, God, it did so many things right. Combat Evolved, to me, is still the most competitive Halo multiplayer. If somebody wants to know the definitive competitive Halo multiplayer, I'm going to point them straight towards Combat Evolved. Because uh, learning the, sp like the spawn system, the melee, the melee mechanics, um, the weapon respawn system... Uh, learning how to spawn teammates in certain locations is the most competitive uh, and skillful gameplay, in my opinion. First of all, I'm going to say you basically just read my mind for, for most of that <laughs> right there. It's like you reached in and yanked well, it all out. You know what I say? Great minds said. think alike. <laughs> and if we have two great minds here, at least I think on your end, we have a great mind. Likewise. Not a grave mind, mind you, a great mind. Hey! So, hey! Iconic. So... Uh, let's talk about first the open world in this, and this is something you and I definitely agree on. One of the things that really drew me to Combat Evolve, what made it stand out among other first-person shooters of its time, was the fact that it was very semi-open world. You could explore, you had choices you could make. In the second mission, when you had three groups of Marines to rescue, you could choose which path you went to, and it would play out differently depending on where you went first. And so that aspect I really did enjoy. But moving on to Halo 2, it was very different. Uh, it, actually, I had someone else point this out to me because kind of like you, I was sort of, you know, I, I was it, in the beginning, I didn't want to accept what I was seeing. So <laughs> I was just kind of like, OK, this is this is good until I really played it for a while and was like, OK, maybe not so much. But the gameplay felt very restrictive compared to Combat Evolve, very restricted and very scripted, especially when you move up to the third mission when you're dealing with the Scarab. And it's not really a real world type deal like in Halo 3 where the Scarabs are, have their own AI. You have to defeat them. This, the Scarab never changed course no matter what you did. You couldn't destroy it by any means. Trust me, I got to that tank once before the Scarab managed <laughs> oh to Oh my god, up, yeah. <laughs> and it didn't work. So it was a very scripted uh, type of environment compared to the, com to the Combat Evolve scenario. And my, my question to you is, since that was something that you really appreciated about the first game, why do you feel differently about it for Halo 2? I, I don't feel differently about it. Halo 2 was certainly missing it, um, I will be honest. It did have a few good areas, like the first tower on Delta Halo, uh, and like 50% of Quarantine Zone was not open world, not in the sense of like Halo from Halo from Combat Evolved, but it was, it was more open. Um, but it... I don't know. I, I did miss that in, in Halo 2, but at the same time, I feel like the level design, it was very linear, but it was... Uh, I don't know. I don't know how to say it. Basically, I, I, I thought it was fun. I thought the level design was fun. There were different routes you could take. Um, the fact that there were literally zero invisible barriers, hard or soft, was fucking fantastic because it meant that technically every single level was completely open. You could go wherever the fuck you wanted. If you see a mountain in the back of Delta Halo, you can get there. That was that was one of the reasons that I didn't mind not having open levels as much because technically, through the Sputnik skull and glitching, every level was completely open. Nice. Okay, so we we have that. That's that's a good way of putting it. Uh, it it's interesting that you say that because. At the same time, you would go through some of these uh, larger missions like Delta Halo, for example, or High Charity, and you would see all these really, really pretty backgrounds sort of teasing you, but you couldn't actually go there. You know, even you mentioned that you had no barriers and so forth, and that's partially true, but even when you go to High Charity and you're looking around and you see the big Forerunner ship in the distance, that's just painted on there. Oh, yeah. yeah you can't actually box, go to yeah. it. And so that was a little disappointing. You never actually get to travel into the lower districts of High Charity. I don't know technically where you are in Halo 3, but you wouldn't recognize it anyway. Nah, you're still in the same same rough area in Halo 3. Yeah, okay. And you're right. The the, mausole the mausoleum of the Arbiter is in Halo 3 as well, if you look close enough. Dude, someone uh, only... Sh I think it was Halo Cannon literally only showed me that the other day. I didn't know about that. You can see it out the window. You didn't know? Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Like Mind-blowing. Learn something new every day, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't know it either until someone pointed it out. I, didn't, I wouldn't have recognized it. And it actually seemed smaller in Halo 3, which was weird. I thought that But that's well. for another video, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that, that sort of uh, got me down a little bit. Another thing that you brought up, which, again, I agree with you with, is weapon, the weapon sandbox. 
Now, in Halo Combat Evolved, you, you had a very small sandbox, but each weapon was effective in its own way if you knew how to use it. And best of all, each weapon was very unique and different. Nothing ever felt like something else. The plasma rifle didn't feel like the assault rifle. The pistol and the plasma pistol worked completely differently. I don't know what the fuck you would compare the needler to, but that was a pretty cool <laughs> homing grenade launcher type deal, so I liked it. Um, and so then you get to... Uh, you know, weapons like the rocket launcher, there was no equivalent to that. The sniper rifle, same deal. And even the fuel rod gun for Halo PC wasn't a Covenant rocket launcher, it was a mortar weapon. Yeah, it played completely So it acted different. very differently. Exactly. And so I liked that diversity. Now you move on to Halo 2, and yeah, they add a ton of new weapons. But they're all Covenant equivalents to the human weapons. They're not really unique or different. They're just... It's, it's sort of an alien clone of what you already are able to use. And it, it, to sort of add to that, when they added the fuel rod gun as a weapon that you could use in the campaign in Halo 2, I was excited to hear about that before the game came out. And then I played it, and I realized that they just made it into a Covenant rocket launcher. It wasn't the same gun. Yeah, it, and yeah so they, my, I will admit they did, they did sort of like mirror them, but I'm not going to say that that makes them boring weapons, though, because... As bad as they were, I still found the Halo 2 Needless to be really fun, dual wielding. Um, <laughs> I don't know, call me a weirdo, but I, I found them fun. Um, weirdo. Yeah, it's not, it's not necessarily a bad <laughs> thing. I will say that um, there are certain situations where, for example, the, the carbine feels very similar <laughs> to the BR, because obviously <laughs> the BR and the carbine are both hit scan, um, and they both fill the same role. So they they feel very similar, um, but I'm not going to say that that's inherently a bad thing because all, all the Covenant weapons were still fun to use, in my opinion. And, and they were, but they weren't as unique. You know, when no. I think of aliens versus humans, I think aliens of having superior technology. And even in the case of Combat Evolved, you can argue which side had the superior tech. We only had access to a couple of Covenant weapons and Halo Combat Evolved, and they had different strengths. Obviously, in the lore, plasma was extremely effective because it would burn through things, and even when it came to the hulls of ships, it would burn through multiple decks. And of course, you don't see that in Combat Evolved, yeah. but you knew that the weapons were, were still a little bit more advanced if you knew how to use them correctly. For example, the Needler, when used correctly, was like a homing grenade launcher. If, if again, you used it correctly, whereas everyone else who didn't know that thought it was just a weak little thing and yeah. should never pick it up. Yeah. And of course, as you mentioned in Halo 2, you could dual wield them. So that made it even cooler. Now, but it seemed a lot less creative and it didn't seem as alien. Even the beam rifle, it did have strengths over the sniper rifle in the sense that if you paced your shots, you never had to reload. You never had to worry about unzooming. But at the same time, it functioned exactly the same way outside of that. And so I, I guess I, your, your words are, it wasn't as bad. And so basically, and I agree with you, but at the same time, you're, you're not saying that it it was a step up in any sort of way. No, it's it's not necessarily a step up. The thing is that you've you got to look at it like there's always a trade-off between weapon quality and weapon quantity. The more weapons you're going to yeah, you're gonna add, unless you've got some really, really imaginative people working on your game, the chances are some weapons are going to start to overlap, like the carbine and the BR, um, and the quality of the weapons is going to drop. It really depends on whether you like having more weapons uh, or like having fewer weapons but more tightly balanced weapons. It's, it's a tra it's a trade-off, and I think at the end of the day, although I will argue that objectively Halo 2's weapon design wasn't as good as Halo 1's, at least in campaign, um, I think whether you want more weapons or more tightly balanced weapons is a matter of personal opinion. And, and, exa and you're exactly right. And pretty much all of this is a matter of personal yeah, opinion yeah, when, sure. you, when you get down to it. And, and so I, I look forward uh, past Halo 2 and I see that when you go to Halo Reach, again, whatever your opinion about the game, you know, is strictly up to you guys and uh, not just to you, Hidden Xperia, but to all who are watching. If I can say that Reach did one thing right, I mean, Reach did it for several things right, but uh, one of the things that I really did appreciate about Reach is they made the weapons more unique again. You know, instead of having a beam rifle, you had the focus rifle. Uh, instead of uh, having, well, we'll, we'll uh, go off to another human weapon here. You had the grenade launcher, which was unique to anything else. They did have something similar on the Covenant side, the plasma caster, I think. Concussion rifle. I'm not sure if that's the right thing. Concussion Con rifle. Uh, well, they had, the, they had the concussion rifle too, but they had another one where... Oh, the plasma uh, launcher. 
Yeah, plasma launch. I'm getting plasma caster from Halo 5. <laughs> oh, I got to slap myself now. Um, so, but they still felt unique as opposed to what we saw in Halo 2 and Halo 3. So, basically what I'm saying, or in that case is, they could have gone the extra mile if they wanted to and made more unique weapons. It seems like to me they sort of took the lazy way out. Yeah, I will, I'll say that Reach did it better than Halo 2. Um, and... I actually, I think Halo 5 did as well. This is one of the only times you'll ever hear me say that Halo 5 did something better than Halo 2. <laughs> um, but I really like the new two, the two new weapons added in Halo 5. The, I think the, the Hydra and the Plasma Caster are both really good, really unique weapons that fit Halo Sandbox really well. Um, but you've got to remember as well, at the same time, like I said earlier, Bungie were like really pressed for time for Halo 2. They were under ridiculous constraints. And at the same time as well, they had to incorporate dual wielding which meant that you you had to rebalance weapons depending on the situation that they're in. So, I, I, as much as I want dual wielding back in Halo, and as much as I love dual wielding back in the day, it throws a massive spanner in the works when it comes to balance and weapon design. And I think that's where Halo 2 probably stumbled. It's interesting that you say that, because I will say that one of the... I'll, I'll say two of the things that Halo 2 did bring to the table that I really enjoyed, and... One of those, we, these things we still have, but was dual wielding for one. I thought it was a new, unique thing. I think most people can agree it's cool to be able to hold two guns at once, especially when you don't have to hold two of the same gun. You can uh, mix them up a little bit, like having a, an SMG and a plasma rifle. That's pretty effective. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, I, <laughs> I was that guy on the, on the field. Oh, my. But at, at the same time, vehicle hijacking was a oh, nice yeah. addition to it as well. Uh, so those are t definitely two gameplay things that we can agree on. Uh, but now we got to move to the, the big elephant in the room. I've said that several times. There's a lot of elephants <laughs> there's, in this there's room. There's quite a few ele elephants in this room. Quite a few. It's a zoo. It's a zoo at this point. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about legendary difficulty. Oh, okay. And, yeah. And we're going to compare that to Halo Combat Evolved. Now, in Bungie's own words, it was not balanced at all. And in fact, on legendary difficulty, the enemy was flat out cheating. Yeah. Now, no, I'm... I'm going to agree with Bungie 100%. <laughs> I, 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 there's no way to defend Halo 2's Legendary. You, you can't defend that. You really can't. In Halo Combat Evolved, it was difficult, and I'm even willing to say that it was the second most difficult Legendary experience in the entire Halo franchise, but it was fair. Yeah. You know, if you knew it was coming, you could prepare for it adequately. No, I, I actually Whereas... I agree with that 100%. I think, I think Halo, Halo 1's was the second most difficult, but hands down the most balanced in fact to uh go a step further did you know that of course there are skulls in halo 2 and i'm mostly known for making mythic difficulty guides which is legendary all skulls on and the other halo games halo 2 does technically have a mythic difficulty and of course i, I didn't even bother attempting that one i had a hard enough time doing my halo 2 legendary walkthrough without dying yeah i was gonna and say so, even, even to even to start mythic you've got to get every single skull and every single mission on legendary and then start yep. again <laughs> And you basically have to make 14 different, or I forget how many skulls there are. I think there are 14 or 15. But you have to make uh, all those different profiles and save them right before you get to the skull. And even then, the I would have been your daddy skull is a nightmare to get. Oh, even yeah. just getting to the point where you have to fight off that army of elites, those ultras, uh, some of them have beam rifles, mind you, uh, is it, it completely insane. So, and, But only to this day, only two people in the entire world have done it. What, and I am not one two? of them. Oh, yes. Two people? Two people have done it. What? I did not know. One of them is you. one of my Holy guys. shit. In fact, I didn't even realize it was two. It really didn't happen until recently. Legendary Smile. I got to give that guy a shout out. He's one of my community members. Uh, and, uh, he's a great contributor to my, to my work and to the community in general. Uh, he has some excellent content. And on his channel, uh, you, there, he's done it. Uh, all single segment for every mission that includes Grave Mind. His Grave Mind Mythic run was two hours long. <laughs> Good lord! And it's something I don't have the patience for it. And so, if you think Legendary is tough, for those of you listening out there, Mythic is a ball buster for sure. In fact, I'd say busting your balls is probably less painful than playing Halo <laughs> Two on Mythic. So, 
Of course, th there, there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, the elites in Halo 2 act very differently from the ones in Combat Evolved. In Halo Combat Evolved, the elites would sort of run around, they'd strafe back and forth, they'd take a few shots at you. In Halo 2, they will stand perfectly still and unload the motherfucking crap, everything onto you, <laughs> just constantly pumping out everything they have, that's what she said. Hell but they're going to be pumping. <laughs> and so they're, they're almost, in, they're, I won't say impossible to beat, but extremely difficult, especially especially when going up against multiple elites with very little cover. Uh, so you really do need to use, utilize that plasma pistol battle rifle tactic, otherwise you're going to have a really rough time getting past those areas. Uh, and then, of course, there's the issue of the flood. Yeah. Now, this is, this is a topic that Hidden Xperia likes, so I'm, I'm, I'm always happy to talk about this. The flood in Halo 2 really didn't feel like the flood in Halo Combat Evolved. You know, in Halo Combat Evolved, they really felt like they had earned their title. They felt like an actual flood of enemies. In Halo 2, it's not quite so much. It's just a few that show up here and there. They're a lot tougher to handle. But what really gets me, especially if you're playing this on Legendary, you really feel the burn on this. The flood combat forms in Halo 2 can wield both sniper rifles and, get this, not just rocket launchers, homing rocket launchers. Really? Yes, oh, really. God. In Quarantine Zone, I specifically, the first time I actually beat Quarantine Zone on Legendary, way back in 2000, actually it was 2005, it took me that long <laughs> Dude, to get like, through yeah. Halo 2 on Legendary, the first time anyway. Uh, I was going through Quarantine Zone with either a Ghost or the, or the Spectre, one of the two, and I just, every time I tried to cross that bridge, boom, I get hit by a homing rocket oh, from God. one of the Flood Combat forms. It took me a good, probably 45 minutes to finally make it past there. And even if I made it past him, he'd just take a second shot once I was past him, and that was it. Couldn't avoid it. I think that that partially may have been why they took homing rocket launchers out, not just for multiplayer reasons, but it was just so imbalanced in campaign. I didn't know the AI could use the homing ability. Yes, they can. And it's, it, oh, it, it's very apparent on Quarantine Zone. I don't know if there's any other real missions in the game where the Flood do have rocket launchers. But in that particular one, yes, they do, and you feel it very hard. The only one, only time I saw one with a sniper rifle, to be fair, was in the mission High Charity. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't you... think I've actually seen that. I think I might have seen one on Quarantine Zone just before you got on the gondola, but that, I don't think I've seen that before, aside from there. There may have been one on the gondola, too. Uh, but basically, uh, when you get to that top level, or that the top of that area right before you enter the... Uh, uh, the the uh, high, or the uh, prophets uh, council chambers. Oh yeah. There's one as soon as you get to the top. Oh god. And I, so that took me by surprise too. I think I dodged that one on, on legendary, luckily. So that uh, and again another extreme imbalance. And so we'll, we'll move on from the flood for a second. We'll talk about the mission regret. And I'm not bringing up what you think I'm going to bring up. I'm saving that for last. Oh, uh, <laughs> we now have these these. So you're getting on the gondola rides, right? You're being dogged by drones, which were not anything like I thought they were going to be heading into Halo 2. Basically just a wall of these guys. They're difficult to hit at times, and they basically slow down the gameplay. They're annoying as hell to fight. But in addition to that, you're also fighting flying elites. Yeah. That can just... And you can't hedge... Like, I've tried noob comboing those guys, and it's a matter of luck. Oh, yeah. Because they can dodge it pretty easily. And the fact as well that you're on a moving gondola, it screws up the projectile. <laughs> It really does. And so that it, there was that to the flying at least. I really didn't understand why they had those in there. If they already had drones, why not just utilize those guys? Um, but now we're going to move on to my... Uh, actually, I take that back. I'm still not done yet. <laughs> we'll, we'll, I want to save my, my favorite thing for last. The next thing I want to move on to is boss battles. Okay. Now, there are ways to do boss battles light. And forgive me for saying this, Halo 5 actually did it correctly. And the reason I say this is because the bosses weren't unfair. They weren't universe breaking. You could kill the warden at any time, yeah. basically, yeah. even if he was a bit overpowered. Um, and if you knew how to kill him right, you could even assassinate him. Now, with Halo 2, it's a bit different. You have three boss battles, but you cannot kill that boss until Bungie says you can <laughs> the way they want you to. And so coming from someone who played Combat Evolved, and there was no universe-breaking uh, boss battles. The closest thing you had was the Hunters, who could possibly count as many bosses, okay? Yeah. What was your reaction? In your opinion, do boss battles like that, universe-breaking boss battles, belong in a Halo game? Um, I, 
I honestly couldn't tell you because I've, I'm yet to see a boss fight work in Halo. I, I, some people seem to think that the, the, the boss fights don't belong in Halo. I disagree. I just don't think we, we've seen them done right yet. I would agree the Warden is probably the closest. Uh, I enjoyed Seiza Rafumi, the, the Heretic Leader's boss fight. I thought that was okay. Um, that was definitely the best in Halo 2. Uh, but the boss fights, they felt very natural. They felt like they belonged there. It's just, I don't think that they were made very well. I just think that they're all very similar. Like you were saying, you can't kill them until Bungie says so. That is that is very true. Like, Tartarus, you have to drop his shields. And let, you have to drop his shields, and you can't do that. You you have to let Johnson do that. And, like, sometimes Johnson will sh fucking shoot the wall. Or sometimes he just won't shoot, or he'll shoot two shots instead of three. That's irritating. Uh, regret was also pretty fucking annoying, especially on Legendary, having the Plasma Rifle Elites constantly shooting at you. Um, yeah. Not to mention, he has an infinite number of troops that come from uh, yeah. one of four rooms that have no other exit, but for some reason there's an infinite number in there. And of course, even if you have rockets or the sword, nothing takes him out except if you hop on his chair and punch him square in the head. Yeah, I always, I always thought that was a bit weird. I think the first time I ever tried doing that, I remember I had like a fully stacked sniper. Uh, and I just tried, I, I tried nailing him with a sniper. I tried firing like, all those rounds into him. And there was also a beam rifle below the stairs in the previous room. I got that. I beam rifled him. And I was like, oh, okay, come on. He's got to be dead soon. He's got to be dead. Nope. Nope. Not even close. Didn't do any damage to him. <laughs> not a single And you're right. You know, the funny thing is, even when you hit him with those weapons, he'll bleed. He'll yeah. even scream. But you won't take any damage. And to go back to your favorite one, the heretic leader, I think one of the things that really bugged me about that is his holograms because he, they have this technology. You never really see it again in Halo, or at least not to this extent. The holograms can do as much damage as the real thing. Yeah. Yet for some odd reason, they don't deploy this as a standard tactic throughout the Covenant. This is the only time you ever see this type of technology. And I just find it weird why the heretic would even bother fighting at all if he can just make an army of these guys. Yeah, just send like an infinite army of holodrones out. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Um... I did think it was kind of, it was kind of funny though, because on anything that wasn't legendary, all you had to do was put one round into each of the holograms to realize which one was a hologram, and then just ignore it, because they they don't they aren't a threat unless you play on legendary, and then of course when you play on legendary, they kill you instantly. But uh, they on, do. Uh, fact, on anything if you put it on legendary, legendary uh, the, the, no, and you're right. Yeah. The interesting thing is on legendary during the heretic uh, fight. Uh, he actually multiplies the number of holograms that he has. In fact, on Legendary, once you get to the final round, he has like eight of them. Really? He does. I didn't know this oh, either until I was doing my Legendary walkthrough. Neither and did I. And I saw several I of them. I never realized that. But again, the only way you're going to know that's on Legendary, because it doesn't take three rounds for uh, the lower difficulties. No. So there's actually more of them uh, in the last round. And I thought it was a glitch in the game. When I saw that many uh, heretic uh, holograms, and I was like, no, apparently it isn't. It really is a thing. That's so that, that sort of bugged bad. me too. And, and so now you're starting to see a little bit from my perspective there. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, and, so, and so now we've talked about bosses. We can both agree that, it, well, your, your term is they haven't done them right yet. Uh, Halo 5 probably is the closest that we've seen. Uh, I could even argue that the Hunters would be uh, decent many bosses if you want to count those. Uh, but the ones in Halo 2 were definitely universe-breaking. Even if you enjoyed the exposition that happened throughout the, uh, the fight. So, the boss battles were a bust. We're going to talk about the final qualm that I have with this. And I think you know where I'm going here. Yeah. And that is the motherfucking jackal snipers. Yep. I, I, I could have put my, put my entire life savings on that. <laughs> fucking jackal snipers. <laughs> I would and love to thing. have seen the bungee playtesters trying to test those. Oh, they were probably laughing their asses off saying, yeah, we need to put this in the game and see how everyone's <laughs> going to react to it. Um, here's the thing about Jackal Snipers. You know, of course, Halo 2 wasn't the only time they were they could one-shot you. In Halo 3, they could. And also now, apparently, in Halo 5, they can as well. Thank you, 343. Really? Um, because they couldn't to begin with, but now, yes, they can. And as a matter of fact, no. I have a video up right now on my site. I'll send it to you at some point. But it's where a Jackal, uh, Jackal Sniper gets an overkill extermination on blue team. <laughs> <laughs> and essentially, I shit you not, it, so basically I'm, in, uh, I'm on the mission blue team, actually, and 
I, I was going up to chase one of the jackal snipers. I was very careful, you know, peeking around the corners and stuff. And I was ready, so I, you know, I, I jumped out. I was ready to shoot. I didn't even have time to react. He just shot me once. I was down. So I called my team to help me. First guy comes up. I think it was Fred. And he tries to resurrect me. Boom, he gets one-shotted. <laughs> then it, the next one comes up. Boom, they get one-shotted. The final uh, Spartan comes up. Boom. Overkill extermination. Get hilarious. that jackal a motherfucking metal. <laughs> Again, I, 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 I've actually posted it Pretty much. In fact, if you've seen my uh, video, the top 25 hardest Halo missions of all time, Blue Team actually makes the top 10 list because of that, primarily. Surely because of the fucking jackals. That's one of the main reasons behind it. And so, and that, that clip is actually in that video. So definitely check it out. And it's same, same with the viewers here. If you haven't seen it yet, uh, I do have its own video on the site, but top 25 hardest Halo missions of all time, it's on there. Here's where the Halo 2 Jackal snipers stand out beyond those, though. First of all, at least in the follow-up games, you had some sort of indicator with the Jackal Sniper. It had some sort of light scope on his head. Yeah. So you at least had an idea of where they were. And at least within other games, maybe with the exception of Halo 5, kind of, sort of, it's, except it was still worse than Halo 2, it would, they would delay in how they shot you, and they wouldn't always hit you the first time either. Yeah, you that know? was so why you at least when had you said chance. earlier that in Halo 3 they one-shot you, I was like... Do they? Because they always miss. They seem to miss the first couple of shots, then they'll hit you. They do. And they, they did that to balance it out a little bit. Yes, the Jackal Sniper can uh, definitely one-shot you, but it takes a little bit of carelessness on your part to actually get shot by them. So if you're good enough and you know where they are, you have a chance. In Halo 2, they can shoot from the hip and sometimes even through objects. <sighs> and they can hit you, the Master Chief icon of the series, <laughs> on any part of your body, including your toe, and boom, there you go on Legendary. You are down in one shot. And the funny thing about this is if you have control of the beam rifle, other enemies, including grunts for God's sake, can absorb multiple rounds before they go down. But you, the Master Chief, Goes down in one shot if you're hitting the toe. Yeah, and that's kind of immersion breaking just a little bit. It is. We've already talked about how, you know, the the missions in general are a lot more linear than Halo Combat Evolved, and this just made it worse. Yeah, for sure, because it you know, gave you only one, one route to attack them from. It did, and even that route didn't always work, because one thing that I did learn, especially from playing that mission Regret, going back to that one, at the beginning of the mission, there's about, I think, five oh, or six Jackal yeah. Snipers throughout that entire area and the thing of it is each time you play they spawn in a different location yeah i'm pretty sure isn't there like a set there's a, there's a set number of spawns for them and you have to learn like seven or eight different spawn locations for five jackals just to get out of the spawn room exactly and to be honest with you when if, if i can get out of the spawn room to that one little uh nook nook and cranny area right near that bridge where you cross over it's a it's luck yeah it's pure luck because I don't know where the Jackal Snipers are going to be. I don't know how many of them are going to spawn or where they're going to spawn. And so getting there is pure luck and it just takes the immersion of it out completely. The Jackal Snipers in Halo 2 are way too overpowered. I never thought why that would be a good idea. As powerful as a lot of those guys in the game, including the bosses, uh, the, Jackal the Jackal Sniper from Halo 2 is the most loathed, villain in the entire <laughs> franchise it's a meme me. at this point it is a meme at this point and, and so to me that really brought the whole experience down and if it was only maybe one or two spots in the game kind of like with halo 3 you have uh, the jackal forest in sierra 117 at least with that one you're pretty much just looking in one direction the entire time you just have to sort of keep an eye out and there's only a few places they can spawn and generally speaking it's not even that the jackals themselves will spawn in different places. It's that it'll be random as to whether or not they'll have a carbine or a beam, or a beam rifle. rifle. Yeah, I like that. I thought that was a nice little ode to Halo 2 as well, that, that jackal sniper canyon. It, it was. It was a nice little ode to Halo 2. At least it was more balanced in Halo 3. But you have these places pop up a lot in Halo 2. Yeah. Not just in Outskirts, but you had it in Delta Halo. Yeah. You had it in Regret. And in uh, some cases, even in the last part of the mission, you'd have a jackal run out of nowhere and just, you know, snipe you while you're trying to get to the uh, next area. Yeah, well, I remember this, the, the last section of Delta Halo, when you're going down that walkway when the drones appear, there's two jackal snipers on the roof, and you have to be, on legendary at least, you have to be really fucking quick taking them both out. Because as soon as you fire at one, the other one just, like, 
instantly fucking aimbots to you and one shots you. You got to be really quick. Oh, not only that, on if you if you stay in that one location too too long, drones come after yeah. you. Yeah. So it was a pretty imbalanced experience, and so at this point. I feel like I've pretty much made my case why I dislike Halo 2 so much, especially compared to the way uh, I had, you know, absorbed Halo into my life. Uh, I had checked out all the marketing, what had brought me to this point. The game didn't deliver what was promised, and even the game itself, even if I look at this from a standalone game point, I, you know, you got two schools of thought here. You can look at it as a Halo game or as a standalone game. As a standalone game back in 2004, I will say overall between the music and the characters and the overall story, it was a good game. And, uh, you know, back then, I think one of the few first person shooters that even had a real story was Half-Life. <laughs> yeah. And outside yeah, of that, they were pretty were generic. Gameplay based. Yeah. So I will say in that area, yes, if you look at Halo 2 as a standalone game, it is definitely better than most of the stuff that was out there, even if you factor in the boss battles and the jackal snipers. But if you came from someone that had played the original Halo Combat Evolved first, followed the marketing campaign, read the books, Halo 2 just sort of veered off in a different direction. Yeah, I will I will agree with that. I'm even though I love the game to absolute death, I'm not about to say that it's completely like perfect in every single way and that that it does nothing wrong, <laughs> although, although I might say that on Twitter a few times, I don't actually mean that. The game definitely does have its flaws. Everything has <laughs> its flaws, but I, I don't know. Across of the music, the atmosphere, the gameplay, the story, uh, the mission with the skyboxes, the multiplayer, I, the characters. I honestly, I, I love that game more than most things in life, and. There's a reason that I play Halo 2 almost every single day, and I, I'm not exaggerating. I do play Halo 2 almost every single day. One thing you can, you and I can definitely agree on is it probably had the best soundtrack oh, yeah. in the series. Hands down, without a shadow of a doubt, Halo 2's soundtrack is... <sighs> my god. My god. When I met Marty, Marty O'Donnell, O'Donnell if you're out there right West, now, I was since you... in awe. Marty has met both of us. If he's watching this right now, I know he's not. But if he is watching <laughs> this right now, big salute to you, man, yeah. for creating one of the best, uh, if not the best, uh, video game soundtrack ever made. So definitely agree with you there. And so this was very constructive. I don't know about you, uh, Hidden Experience, but I gained some new perspective from you, and it gives me a little bit more of an appreciation. And I hope you were able to get something out of it, too. Oh, yeah, for sure. I never actually looked at... Um... Uh, Halo 2 from the perspective of somebody who followed the marketing campaign intently uh, before. That's actually that's a new perspective that I've never actually thought of. So yeah, it's been it's been interesting. This has been an awesome uh, awesome. I had a great time with you today, Hidden Xperia. I am honored to have you with me today. <laughs> nice to I look forward to working with more projects on you, uh, pr more projects with you in the future, guys. If you aren't already subscribed to this guy, he has probably hands down the best lore videos ever <laughs> uh, about Halo, and I'm not even exaggerating. Just triggered there. Halo Every kinda. time he makes one, I've got to click. I've got to click it for sure. And if you if you aren't already subscribed, I'm gonna post a link in the description below. Definitely click on it. Check out his stuff. Definitely worth your time. Uh, every video he has is immersive, and you learn something new every time. Hidden Experience, thank you so much for joining me ah, today. Thank you, dude. It's been a pleasure. It's been great. All right, so you guys, so what do you think about it? Now that you've heard it from both sides, what do you think of Halo 2? What's your perspective on it? Do you like it a little bit more? Do you like it a little bit less? Whatever your opinion is, you can let me know in the comments below or hit me up on Twitter at Mythic Tyrant. A link to my Twitter feed can be found in the description below. And if you want to become a premium member on this site for as little as $1 a month, get lots of rewards and prizes and help keep this site going through 2018, all you got to do is check out my Patreon page. Again, a link can be found in the description below. And of course, we have a new store that we set up. Lots of new stuff there. Dozens of items, including a wireless keyboard, t-shirts, you name it. Check that out too. I'm going to post a link to that also in the description below. And if you like this video and you want to see more and you want to stay up to date on all your Halo news, tips, tricks, and secrets, don't forget to click that subscribe button for more great content every single day right here on BigTiber.com. Thank you guys so much for watching, guys and gals alike. Hidden Experience, again, thank you so yep. much for being here. Is there any last words you want to say to your fans before we leave? My pleasure, dude. Thank you, thank you to everybody for watching. Uh, hopefully, I converted more people over to the cult of Halo 2. Uh, trust me, guys. <laughs> we, we, have the best we have the best cookies over here. The best cookies and wine. I, I can assure you that.
Well said, Halo. Well said, Hidden Xperia. Hell, Halo 2 and Hidden Xperia both start with the same letter. Well, technically, the whole franchise does. <laughs> there you so go. It's always there good you go. That's iconic enough. That's more than that's more iconic than anybody can take in. Iconic is definitely a word I would describe. Thank you so much for being here, my friend. And thank you guys so much for watching, guys and gals alike. I will catch you all right back here next time. And as always, I'm the Tyrant, signing off. Goodbye.